thank you for joining us today. We are here at Downtown Design 2021, a Dubai Design District, and we're celebrating Dubai Design Week with a panel discussion featuring David Schill from Aritco, Lena Benassa from Lightspace Design, and Isabel Pintado from Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts. Uh, today, we're going to talk about something that I think we've all become very attuned to, and that is embedding wellness and well-being in our high-tech homes. Um, and I would start with Isabel. And basically, it's conversation. All of these questions are for everyone. Um, and it's just about gaining insight into all three very different sides of the business, which is very interesting because Isabel has been the head of Wilson Associates running and designing hotels. And now she's on the other side. Um, asking designers to design hotels. Uh, Lena has been working on a range of projects that include hospitality, res residential, sports, and art galleries. And David Schill is from Aritco. And basically, what have we learned about the last one year? We are producing lifts. We are producing uh, around 4,000 lifts per year uh, from Scandinavia, from Stockholm in Sweden. And from there, actually, we send more or less 95% of them to different parts of the world. Uh, we focus on Scandinavian design, we focus on smart innovation, and we spore, uh, li like uh, how can you steer different things through apps, how can you get sensors to be more safe, etc. Because safety and sustainability is a core part of, of our thinking. Uh, so then you come to why are we talking about health and well-being then? Uh, I think for us it is extremely important to understand how we can be a part of the future ecosystem and how people are thinking and living now, but rather beyond. Uh, and how are things changing in the homes, in the, in, in the city planning, in the sustain world of sustainability, the climate crisis? Where can we be play our part and what do we need to think about when we are actually then planning for future products or ways of working around our products? So therefore, for instance, uh, we, uh, we this year, uh, uh, we, we released a, a trend report in the beginning of the year called uh, Future of the Home. Uh, so what happens uh, uh, after the pandemic, pandemic? What do we need to think about? And what are different innovations and trends? And one of the key things is what we're going to talk about today. So redefining wellness post-COVID. What is happening in the houses? I think on that note, Lena, Please tell us about what Lightspace Design is doing now and how the past year has been for you. Well, I mean, um, regarding COVID, I don't think we really changed our approach specifically to the way that we design, but our main philosophy at Lightspace Design is about space and light, as it, its name you know, suggests. Um, it's about giving people the space that they require within their homes in order to feel comfortable and to feel that sense of wellness that everything is kind of clutterless and you feel like your space is flexible enough for you to have different types of activities within your home. And I think that's a relevant point when we look at how people are living now with COVID, being stuck in their homes, having a bunch of different activities in the same space. Um, and that is due a lot to the fact that we have mostly open plans. And how do we kind of now adapt that to living with other people and having our privacy without boxing up the home um, per se? Perhaps that comes with flexible products, as you mentioned, or, or ways of designing proper circulation so that we have specific types of space within the home that are designated for a type of activity that we might have within the home. Thank you. Isabel. Sorry. The question for you is very specifically, first, how has it been the feeling and the experience of being on the other side? How's the feeling? The feeling's been wonderful, really. Busy, very, very busy, and an awful lot to do. Uh, under the remit of my role is design and product and innovation globally. So it's from the interior design of the projects, choosing the consultants, our own night platform, our employee fashion. It's, it's just about every aspect. So it's been accelerating, it's been exciting, and I'm still sort of landing there. You know, it's been coming up to 11 months, and I still discover things every day. You, know, it's, you feel that it's going to be the same as being in the consultant side, because I've been designing hotels for so long, and it's very different. 
very, very different, which is good, which is good. At, at that point in my life, in my career, it's being given this chance to continue with my knowledge and expand it from a different angle. It's, it's a blessing, really. Well, on that, um, it's a question for all three of you. And, and I want to start with how has your understanding of the home evolved uh, in the last, well, two years now? Should I go first? <laughs> Thank you. Um, how the home has evolved. I think homes are no longer just homes. If you think about it, homes have become our offices. They've become our gyms. They've become our nurseries. They've become our schools. So it's, it's a completely different platform that we're springing from. We, the proportion of time that we're spending in our homes now is it's tenfold to what we used to do. In particular, many individuals such as us that spend an awful lot of time traveling, a home was sort of touch base where you kept your suitcases, where you kept things, and, and obviously where your family is. I should say that first. But, it's, it's <laughs> but it, it was very much a place where you went to, to switch off but not do much there. What we find now is our homes have become these hubs of activity. It's, it's, it's become so much more open to the, to the public. If you think about it, now we constantly on camera. I mean, I've had a chance to meet every child of my colleagues, every pet of my colleagues. I know when the delivery from Amazon is arriving because they have to stop the call and go and answer. So it's, you, you, in a way, you, you spend, it sort of absorbed you, if you think about it, it's become your cocoon. And at the same time, you've had to open up that cocoon to the world. You know, the backdrop of where your camera is it's, uh, facing right now has become the world. Like you turn around and you go, okay, I'm, I need to be more creative there. I need to do something about it. So it's, it's a homes, it's a before and after. I don't think we can look at our homes in the same way. People have been investing in much bigger properties because they do need that space. Something that, Lena, you touched on before, this notion that... Um, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank now. Um, oh, something that you said before that really sprang to mind. Uh, yes, the privacy, the, the multi-use, sorry. That's, that's what, what, you know, one of the things that you said that I thought, yes, that has a lot of meaning to it. We have, we're lucky in this part of the world to have homes that are slightly larger than other parts of the world. So it's a blessing in a way because we're not being so confined to, you know, you see it in colleagues in, in Europe in particular, where the dining table became the school for the kids. It became the meeting room for the husband. It became everything. Over here, we have slightly larger properties. But what that happens is that you tend to have very little privacy between one space and another. And I think the way forward, and something that as designers or as consultants, we sort of need to do, I have to remind myself I'm no longer that, but you know that, that principle of it, that we need to come up with ideas of how do we create privacy, which be it from an acoustic point of view, be it through a visual point of view, how do we bring that into the equation? I mean, I'm sure, Pratish, you've been at home, you know, and you've been on conference calls, and your dogs, you know, the, the space within the house, your, you know, friend, friends, etc. How do you? divide that? How do you create a barrier between your work life and your personal life? So I think most of us have lost so much of our personal time. How do we give that a twist from a design point of view? Um, yeah, I think you raised some very valid points. And, and just to touch a little bit on the, on the wellness aspect of this topic, to feel like we, we, you know, that well, well-being kind of state of mind within our homes, privacy is very important, but it's also to do with the, the health, the mental health or physical health, and how our homes can become more than just a place where, you know, we, we sleep and, and now we work as well, but a place that can be useful and have a proper function and, or maybe several different functions not only to make us feel better, but to make the environment that is sitting in feel better. So perhaps with, so for me, high tech doesn't necessarily mean, you know, screens and, um, and connectivity to, to um, different digital interfaces. Technology is, is tools. It's the application of a knowledge in order to make something better. So 
through the tools that we've acquired now, we can use that in order to develop new materials that are more sustainable and embed that into the home itself for the home to become a protagonist really in our in our day-to-day -day lives and in making our lives better and in making our environment better. So whether that is in less emission of toxins or, you know, producing resources perhaps um, is a, a thought. If I may, just two seconds, David. I think to some extent, finishes are an incredibly important part within the wellness of a home. But I see finishes more like the clothes that you wear, the analogy of that. That if the core component of it, your, your body, you know, your structure, your muscles, your gut, to some extent, if that is not addressed, whatever you wear, to some extent makes a difference, but it only touches it at surface level. I think what matters the most is that we look at the core of what makes our homes a healthy environment. So how we distribute them, how we light them, how do we ventilate them, those things that make you internally feel good. There we go. Building on both of, of, of your thinking, I do believe that uh, this change that we have seen for the last two years is it's not about getting back to the old this is very much what we now are living and continuing living with uh, it, it it is and it will be a multi-purpose home uh, you will work there you will live there you will dine there you will have your leisure time there you will have maybe vacation in there and travel in 3d somewhere else to a volcano in Iceland with another tour guide that is coming somewhere from, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, you will invite your friends, you will have all of these different situations, but that also comes to wellness, training, workout. The home suddenly gets to be so multi-purpose. And then suddenly, uh, how do we cope with you know, loneliness out of that, mental health? Uh, we see different innovations where you actually can connect yourself with different, with friends, uh, small, small, small sensors that, you know, connect whose, whose home can you actually uh, uh, connect with someone by just putting your, your hand on a small stone, it starts glowing their home and then say, wow, okay, someone is thinking of me. You know, how do we work about, uh, uh, work around different types of, of, of uh, uh, loneliness, mental illness. Uh, but also, of course, out of the, you know, when you, all these steps that you do daily, getting out of your home, getting uh, back home, walking around in the office, having a meeting, uh, going for lunch, all these normal daily steps, you have to pick them up somewhere else. And everybody's trying to find space for, for workout or, or, or doing different things. So the multi-purpose homes and therefore also multi-purpose uh, uh, furniture or other types of solutions will just I think continue to develop and develop because this is the situation it will continue then we also need to make it sure make sure that it actually welcomes everybody you know um, technology is one thing um, but as Isabel said we suddenly were welcomed into everyone's rooms everyone's homes um, I knew uh, which colleagues my dogs liked more depending on how quiet they remained when they were speaking on zoom but what ultimately that led to is that we could no longer look at colleagues um, even distant family members or friends as just that we got to see a huge spectrum of their lives and they got to see ours so the sense of empathy the sense of how do we treat this person whose child we've seen or whose wife we've had a lovely conversation with in the future when we go back to dealing with them face to face. So there's technology, but there's also the lev our level of empathy has increased, which to me is slightly contradictory because sometimes people are very scared of technology, and especially when technology comes into their homes. So for example, I am, especially at hotels, it, and I know how things work. I mean, I have a past life as an architect and interior designer. Those technology, the, the buttons, they still freak me out. You know, it still takes time for me to figure out which light goes then. That's just the basic. So I'm thinking, where is this technology? If we're looking at technology as a key to well-being, how is the technology being made more humane? In regards to 
you know, what's called GRC systems, where you have the automation of within the room. I think we all striving, and not just at Four Seasons, I think all of us are striving to simplify those settings. So in no way they alienate you. When, you know, there's nothing worse than not being able to switch your lights off. And it's happened more than once. I have to call reception again. Okay? The television is staying. I'm not able to switch things off. So I think we're all trying to make things feel and function in a in a simpler way, which in reality is a more complex way. Everything that's behind it is more complex. But for our use, for our end user use, it becomes simpler. No? So I think in that way it's 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 working. We also think in the past there was a sense that. If you added more and more and more, it was more luxurious. And we've now come to the conclusion that, in fact, the simpler, the more luxurious it is, because you don't alienate the guest. Um, I think technology is, is wonderful as long as it's easy to use and makes your life easier. The moment that it alienates you, the moment that makes you resent that technology, then it's the wrong technology. And, and, and building on what you're saying, Isabel, I think uh, here the digitalization with uh, uh, artificial intelligence especially will play a huge part in the home. So uh, when the technology is learning our own personal behavior yeah, and can relate to my needs and my ways of doing things in, in my house uh, where I can actually use the technology without all the buttons where I can actually communicate and have a dialogue and they already know what I need or how I'm going to behave and suggest me how to actually solve different things. I think that is the personalization of the technology and with emotions that actually will and empathy that will actually take the next step. Yeah, I, I found that very interesting. Um, it's so for my masters, I had studied this subject specifically. It's uh, about living architecture and how how the home of the future is interpreted by us and what it could be. So potentially, when we think, oh, the future, it's going to be very digitalized and, and AI. But I think a point that you're mentioning, David, is very relevant because it's about the personalization and the emotional response that we have within our homes, and this is what makes us understand whether or not we feel good in our homes. Um, it's through the senses, through sight, what we see, if it's beautiful, if it's cluttered or not, um, what we smell as well, what we touch, so for comfort. And a home that is intelligent enough to understand our needs, uh, be preemptive, adapt and change all the time, becomes to me sort of a living home. It becomes an entity in itself. Um, so it, it also makes me think there's a, a place in London called uh, Maker's Row and it's filled with houses and all these houses in the past used to be both where people worked and lived. So they had their downstairs where they, sell, they sold goods or whatever and then on the top they would you know, have their children and, and their home lives. Um, and nowadays I think we're kind of going back to that in a way that we're not really controlling. It's overwhelming us now because you know, we don't have the space for it. But what if our homes could be some place where we could, you know, um, create a means of remuneration as well? Um, and when I say that, I think of spaces or places where the home is not as luxurious or as open as we might have it here in other places. Well, people are waiting for social housings to be built, but these social housings could be useful to them. It could be a place where they can work and, and live at the same time and produce resources of their own and give anyone a chance to kind of be part of the society and, and, and create a new life for themselves through the use of the house. Thank you. Um, all of you work with clients and now you work, you work with consultants now, you're the client now, but all of both of you have clients and from b both different perspectives, where has this conversation about wellness or smart wellness as we should call it rather than obvious examples of wellness or let's put a gym there. How has that evolved in your industries in terms of that communication or that appreciation from the other side? I can start. Uh, I think from 
uh, what we see, we do a lot of, uh, as I mentioned before, research, and of course we do a lot of home interviews, understanding what, what, what is changing in everybody's home and what. Uh, uh, so, so what I see is the emotional part we, uh, we see that everyone is lacking and want to open up. So I really want grandma to take part. Uh, I really want my full family now to, to, to be included in my house and all the activities. Uh, and what comes there is very much for, for many of our clients uh, uh, is that they are rather talking about but how can i open up the space how can you help me with your type of products lifts etc to actually you know i want grandma to also experience that roof terrace uh, because otherwise she's not going to be part of the full spectra of our house we cannot uh, engage together we cannot uh, take that dinner or she cannot see grandma uh, the, the grand uh, the grandkids rooms uh, or the new drawings or whatever they have done so a lot of emotionalizing the usage of the product I think is coming very very uh, uh, intensively in, in different ideas uh, but also as we were talking about uh, artificial intelligence there is a why why can't I have a welcoming in the morning good morning David do you want to go down to the garage as usual uh, at this time because the, the product understands. So all these emotionalization inclusiveness, I think is what people are really, really want to add to the aspect right now. Yeah, um, when you talk about inclusiveness, there's also the, to circle back on what you said earlier about being social and connecting not only with the people that you live with, but also the people that are around you. Um, there's a lot, there's something in Australia, a project, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but it was a kind of hub for young people to live in, but they had common areas where they could grow vegetables and they, and they could socialize. So it's an environment where they have their own privacy, so they have their, their space and where they live, but they also have a common living space where they can exchange you know, ideas, thoughts, like we're doing right here, and, and also exchange goods and, and ways of, of living. So I think it's important especially with COVID where we felt very secluded. There's a lot of people that live by themselves as well because we're talking a lot about how you deal with your family, but how do you deal with being on your own? Um, so there should be some kind of way to connect with other people and, and interact with people that are not necessarily your family members um, in, in that aspect. Drawing from what you just, just said, it's how, what le at what point do we need privacy? And at what point do we need socializing? And I think it comes back to, you know, we're all different. Some of us are more introverts or extrovert. Uh, we, we draw energy in a different manner in, in how we socialize. In the world of hospitality and what we're seeing, coming back to your question, in what we see from our guests and the need is to be able to marry both and to be able to feel private within a public space. And I think that that's the key thing to, for us to address moving forward with, with hotels. You want to be working, you want to be having conference calls, which you know, have become part of a day-to-day -day life. But you don't necessarily want to do so isolated in your room because there's an aspect of, of alienating yourself really socially when you work from your room, when you dine from your room. I mean, unless you're exhausted, it really is your last option normally. So it's how do we bring that into the public spaces? How do we bring that in a way that you're not disturbing the people around you? So that's a massive drive that we have in now and studying what we call task spaces. You know, where can you sit down? And, and you know, you arrive at a property and I spend my life traveling. I arrive at a property and immediately sort of trying to identify, okay, I can take a call from that chair I can take a call from there. In that restaurant, I won't bother people if I'm, you know, having these conversations that are sort of one-sided. Because if you're listening to somebody's conversation and you hear both sides, you feel as if you belong to that conversation. But when you're in a place and you're only hearing one end, you feel very excluded, you know, the people around you. So it's quite harmful psychologically. So it's, 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 it's something that we need to look at is how do we work how do we meet? How do we socialize within the public environment? And that touches on wellness from the side, more of the psychological, social aspect. 
from us in the case of the rooms, uh, fitness has become an enormous component. So for us, wellness in the past was more located within the gym. It was located within the spa. And I think that those boundaries have disappeared to some extent. And wellness is now spread around the property. You, you know, you, anything that makes you feel better, anything that makes your body feel healthier, you know, and that touches on how we address restaurants, how we address public spaces, areas to do exercise. And you've, I'm, I'm sure you've all had a chance to see or experience where gyms are no longer limited to the gym. You know, we're trying to bring them out, and us as well as other operators, you're trying to to bring the gym into your room as well. So is, is that openness to make sure that you have a chance to feel stronger? I think those are very real um, solutions, and solutions that are already there. People are aware of them. They know what it looks like. It's not alienating. But I think from what I've understood from all of this is that we can do a lot from our side as designers, as, as clients, as operators, but there's a lot more thing, uh, the research that's going into it, the technology, the research, whether it's the products that are being created, chairs that make you feel, you know, enclosed, they might have, you know, built-in PowerPoints for people to put their marks on. For you, the materials, that's where I really want to go to. I mean. It's okay to create barriers and put things in between people and tell, put stickers on the floor and say you stand there. But one day all of those things will go away. But is this time taking reflection, some technology advancements in the materials so that the wellness or the hygiene or the sanity is not just dividing screens, but it's actually the material or the product or the design in itself? Um, so just to touch on that, um, now it is, well, 3D printers have been around for a long time, but they're evolving more and more, you know, in scale and in the materials that we actually use in the 3D printers. So perhaps we don't really have concrete examples of it per se as a finished product, but there's a lot of um, testings that have been done in the past, like the living pavilion in the MoMA, that was now seven years ago, where they used mycelium, which is the, you know, a part of the mushroom. Um, in order to create walls out of it. And this material is a living material that breathes and, and adapts and changes over time. And after its life cycle is over, as we know, a lot of homes and spaces that we build, uh, don't, uh, they're not meant to last forever. They're meant for 10 to five years, especially for homes, for example. There's always gonna be someone else that comes in and say, no, start over, I want something else. So what happens after that? Does this architectural fabric return to nature? or does it become clutter and become wastage? So we need to think more about how we use our resources in nature, in, in things that we can synthesize through the use of science and technology to create new materials that can adapt and be flexible. So it's not about a screen that can fold, but it's more about something that's been perhaps 3D printed and using a semi-living tissue as a resin and that resin can be also intelligent and kind of move around depending on when we need it to, to or not. I love the thought of what you're saying of, of sort of homes having this sort of the re recycling time frame that is not so rigid that opens up you know one that is sort of absorbed back the mushroom uh, material. The, this notion that we're not so craving to have things finalized or you know that it must be this way and it has to be this way for the next 20 25 years the notion of our homes becoming like platforms platforms where you know like stages that you choose to live one way or another that you have um, a powerpoint a setup that gives you the flexibility to do so I mean, it's as simple as you arrive at a home half the time the bed position is already marked because your PowerPoints are there, your points are there, you're told your television is going to go here. So how do we evolve? One, to give people more creativity. You know? And it's something, I mean, we do um, standalone residences. And it's something that's making me think, you know, how do we go about giving people more and more flexibility? And how do we select those finishes in a way that they are less rigid, that they're less in a way, dictatorial of how people should live. It is open up the flexibility. So no, thank you. 
on, on your topic of, of health and bacteria or hygiene, etc., I think we see a lot of interesting innovations uh, coming around. I just saw a shelf where you put your keys and your phone, and 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 uh, it was a multi-shelf layer. Uh, and individually on each of these shelves, you had a small beam with ultra. Uh, violet light that was actually killing bacteria so you know uh, there are I think there are lots of different solutions coming on that supporting the home to also let's get rid of the marks let's get rid of all of the gloves let's get rid of all the ma uh, face masks etc yeah but what is the other solution then? And I think more and more technology is helping us there to actually sanitize or make it make it bacteria free. Also on the material part of, uh, as we discussed, uh, the material part of the side, we, we are looking for different control boards that actually are in new material that bacteria never stick on, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there are a lot of, of these type of solutions I think we will need to adapt to, but that is, you know, how do you change a full home into all of these new things and where are the key parts and how do you make it non-intrusive so you can relax in the design and feel good about the home. It's like my home is not just a healthcare center. Yeah. Thank you. And on this very hopeful and optimistic note, uh, I'm going to open the floor to any questions if anyone has anything to ask our lovely panelists. I have a question. Hello. Hi. So I have a question to Isabel. So in regards to, I mean, we, we see, of course, with all the changes, there's a much more holistic approach to things now. So it's not only a bit of interior design to make a space more welcoming and comforting for guests in specific. So the question is now, I mean, now you're with a big hotel chain and brand. And uh, so how is the holistic approach in terms of not only for the design? So I guess uh, your, your brand has something in place. And I think... Uh, it's quite interesting to know. So, I mean, we know it's not only this and this, and it's also food or any other things. Thank you, Vera. It's always nice when somebody asks questions. So, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yes, holistic at every level. I think there is from when, when you have a stance towards wellness, towards sustainability, you need to make sure that that stance is followed by all your partners. And I think that's the key, right? To establish, okay, I stand for this in, in the construction. Uh, is it uh, Leeds Gold? Is it, you know, whatever you identify with or whatever the region in particular that the project is identifies with. So it's about understanding what you stand for, something that is understandable enough globally by everybody, but that you adapt to regions. It's about how you procure, because if you procure without following those principles, however much you put on paper, however much you announce to the world that your building is this or the other, if your procurement does not follow that, then you've undone every effort that you've designers or your consultants have, have applied. It's about who you partner with, so the firms. There's the ethos, that ethos that you have, that you're striving towards. That ethos has to be shared no? in different approaches, but the, the gist of it has to be shared. What we're doing now is we are working with external consultants who do, to some extent, the validation of, of the procurement, validation of the sourcing, etc. So from uh, elements that we have in our rooms, like towels, uh, amenities, etc., we are asking external people who can see from an, uh, a different filter, okay, how is this being applied? How is this truly being applied to, you know, you were talking about your lifts flying to different places. We need to also find that balance of sourcing, location, etc. And many times, something that is very um, consciously manufactured is worth flying in from quite far away. It's, it's not always locality or, or it's coming from nearby that makes it most sustainable. So it's all of these filters. But the key, coming back to your question, the key is sharing those principles and make sure that every aspect of how you get about uh, building and running a property follow the same principles. On that, thank you for coming. And we're done.